Welcome to the Power Pitch presentations in the Giant Leap to Mars category. This is a special category added exclusively for the 2015 competition. This year marks the 45th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. In celebration of this anniversary, NASA and the Conrad Challenge invited participants to design creative solutions addressing the issues and challenges for landing on Mars. This includes long duration space travel, healthcare, nutrition, and quality of life. Today, nine teams will present their innovations that could positively impact the future mission to Mars. Couple notes to take into consideration, guys. Every team gets six minutes to present. At five minutes, 30 seconds, Jack will wave you guys and let you know at six minutes, you'll be asked to stop. Remember, always speak into the microphones because we are broadcasting this live via internet. And there will be no chance to Q&A with the judges after your presentation. So make, you can, if you have any questions, make sure to ask them after all the power pitches are done. All right? First team up is North Carolina School of Science and Math in Durham, North Carolina. Please welcome Hirest with the innovation Hirest. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nimit Desai, and I am representing a team of four with our product, Hyrus. Now, with Hyrus, we are very dedicated to finally making the dream of going to Mars come true. But first, let's take a look at the Earth. Wouldn't you say that Earth is a very interesting planet and a unique planet? Well, of course it is. But I'm more focused on the radiation aspect. Earth's environment sets up conditions to allow Earth to block radiation. This comes in a sort of a two-prong approach. First, with the magnetic field, and second, with the ozone layer. The ozone layer is located in the stratosphere, and it absorbs the UV radiation. The, ma the magnetic field clusters charged particles in the atmosphere from the radiation into bands around the Earth. Now, this two-prong approach pretty much makes, makes sure that Earth receives as little radiation as possible in the society and community we live in today. However, space radiation becomes a problem when we go beyond the magnetic field. And this is what happens in interplanetary and deep space missions. Now, in these missions, astronauts are exposed to harmful radiation, particularly ionizing radiation. And this radiation comes generally from the sun, and as it's the biggest contributor. Now, this presents the astronauts with a big problem. This ionizing radiation has the ability to change the configuration of atoms and molecules and electrons in the atoms. And this is, har is harmful, particularly because it destroys cells and mutates our DNA. This leads to a very high probability of, of, of getting cancer. So now let me ask you a question. Would you spend three years in a tiny capsule just to come back with, the dead, with deadly cancer? Chances are probably not. And NASA recognizes this. That's why they set a goal of only, three, only, of only a 3% chance of getting cancer. And the solutions on the market don't do enough justice to this problem. Some, some solutions include Demron and water. Now both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Demron, although it's lighter than aluminum, is not a very good blocker for radiation. On the other hand, water is a good block, absorbs radiation properly, but it's very heavy and it's impractical to include it in a space, in a space shuttle. So considering these current um, ideas on, in the market right now, we first created a few requirements our solution had to address. First, it had to be lightweight. It also had to block the radiation e efficiently and it has to, be, has to have sun-dependent positioning. This means that it should be able to um, target the radiation, particularly coming from the sun, as that's the biggest contributor. In addition, this shield should be cost-efficient cost, cost and easily adaptable to current space shuttles. So with this, we present to you HiRES. HiRES is basically a retractable shield made of sodium borohydride. This shield, you can think of it kind of like an umbrella outside of a space shuttle, except bigger. 
Sodium borohydride has a high content of hydrogen, making it a very good blocker of radiation. This shield will be able to move according to the position of the sun relative to the, relative to the space shuttle, ensuring that we block that radiation. In addition, the shield will be able to retract back into the, into the base of the space shuttle to allow us to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Now, with the progress we've made so far, it has been primarily focused on design. We have used mathematical modeling to take into account the length and width of the shield to address certain shield parameters. We had to take into account the maneuverability, the range of radiation protection, and the cost of the material in the shield. Now, what does an astronaut gain from this? Well, he gains a healthy life. With this shield, we will make sure that astronauts are not exposed to the harmful radiation that they would encounter in deep space. It mitigates the worries of radiation and allows interplanetary travel, particularly a giant leap to Mars. Now, let's talk a little bit about the marketing plan. First, we will establish a partnership with NASA to further our research and development. We'll buy materials, test them, and create the final product. Once we've created the product, we will then pitch our idea to private ventures who actually make the space shuttles. We'll, we'll pitch to SpaceX and Lockheed Martin. In addition, we'll also, in the mature phase of our product, we will talk to international space agencies, such as those in Japan, China, Russia, and even India, to, to just name a few. Now, I'm here today asking you to invest in our business. And what will this investment do? Well, we will use it to develop a sodium borohydride shield first. Then we will use it to create a retractable arm that allows the shield to uh, be stored in the space shuttle. Then we'll combine these two ideas into one final product and pitch it to investors with the remaining money we have. So this is our team, and unfortunately my other team members were not able to make it, but they really wanted to be here. And we have a very particular set of skills that we believe will be able to bring high risk to fruition. And one thing I want to end on is that we, NASA has created a deadline of 2030 to get to Mars. We need to invest in high risk now. It's not a question of if, but it's a question of when. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, HiRest. Our second team is also from North Carolina School of Science and Math in Durham, North Carolina. Please welcome Electrowave Nation with their innovation, Microcharge Medical Receiver. Hi, my name is Daniel Magley, and I represent Electrowave Nation as the captain and patent holder. My other teammates, Zhang Zhu and Betty Liu, uh, send their condolences for not being able to attend today, but they're here in spirit. So our product is a microcharge medical receiver. Okay, so first I want to start off with a program that NASA started back in the 1990s called the Technology Transfer Program. This program was made to take NASA technologies and bring them back to Earth. One of the main technologies that they like to highlight a lot is that they took a power system from one of their space shuttles and they converted it to be used in pacemakers to go on ahead and allow for wireless communication with these pacemakers. Another program that I want to highlight is NASA's SPS Alpha program. This program went on ahead and it took satellites and put them up into the space 
and they had solar cells on them, and they would harvest energy, and the goal was to beam that energy back down to Earth using microwave radiation. So, currently there are five million implanted biomedical devices worldwide. 600,000 pacemakers are implanted each year, and 35,000 deep brain simulators. However, deep brain simulation is a growing market. As we learn more about the human brain, more and more uses are being known. The two that I'm going to highlight today focus on Parkinson's disease and depression. Or not Parkinson's disease, sorry, chronic pain. So, how does this apply to a colony on Mars? Obviously, it applies on Earth, however, when we start thinking about people that we send up to space, NASA's going to send the best, the brightest, and the healthiest. They're not going to likely send up someone with cardiac arrhythmia. So what exactly is the purpose? The purpose is this. First off, we can't expect everything to go exactly right on Mars. There's going to be injuries. We'd be foolish if we thought that there wasn't going to be some broken arms or things like that that occur when going out on missions. There's mountains climb and places survey, and overall the terrain is very dangerous and hostile, but that's part of the attraction of it. So, even the best and the brightest can have injury or need for treatment. And this is where chronic pain comes in. Using deep brain simulation, we can treat chronic pain without using medications and pills and whatnot, and we can instead go on ahead and use implanted pulse generators. This is much more reliable, and in the different situations on space, allow for a lot less contingencies that could occur. Mars is currently several months away by spacecraft. If we had to send someone back to Earth because this, say this is a sustainable co colony, and we start having childbirths on Mars, we start getting people coming up, all of a sudden genetics comes into play and we end up with a person with something like the need for a cardiac pacemaker or something like a catheter, and suddenly we need to start operating surgeries on them on Mars, that can be troublesome, and we might need to send them back to Earth. Each trip back is going to be a $2, million, $2 billion venture. We don't exactly want to spend that. So, if lives are compromised by injury and the transport is two billion, how do we save this? How do we save this money? How do we avoid this possible contingency? The answer is that implanted biomedical devices are going to go on ahead and have a microwave receiver that gets implanted within the human body. This allows us to transfer the power wirelessly using the previous technologies that NASA brought down to Earth and go on ahead and recharge the batteries that could be within these devices that we would have within our astronauts and or Martians, whatever we want to call them, up on Mars. So here's how it works. We have a transmitter located outside of the human body. This transmitter beams microwave radiation over a large area at the skin. With the frequency we operate at, we see a focusing effect with the skin, causing the microwave radiation to focus into a smaller area and have a higher power density so that the receiver can have the maximum gain possible. With this gain, we're able to recharge a battery within safe radiation exposure requirements set by the FDA. So, when we started this off, we wanted to see that it works, and we showed that we could recharge a pacemaker battery with typical specifications as a pacemaker battery is today, and also an implanted pulse generator battery. We found that we would have a recharge rate of about 8 milliamps, and we also sent through safety and FDA testing using SEMCAT X and SEM for Life platforms. These are the same platforms used to approve products like Google Glass and various MRI systems. Comparing to the current systems on the market, there's currently a, something called a TET coil system. This operates off of inductive coupling, similar to if you have a rechargeable toothbrush that you recharge wirelessly. Inductive coupling operates at a lower frequency than microwave power transfer, and this causes the antenna sizes to be much larger. This device overall takes up 70 cubic centimeters of volume. What we did, since we were able to find a method using that specific frequency with the focusing effect and an antenna that didn't limit the current gain as we started to transmit more power, we were able to minimize the size down to two cubic centimeters of volume. Which would you want in your astronaut's chest? So let's address the general usage. Currently, a pacemaker uses about 4.4 milliamp hours a week. Implanted pulse generators are going to be about 8.8 about 8 .8 milliamp hours per week. This translates to 30 minutes to an hour of charging per week. An astronaut could be doing their daily chores and wear this patch system that we hope to develop for the transmitter to go on ahead and transmit the power wirelessly into their device. Overall, each unit costs $30 currently to make. They can be sold for about $1,000. Each device will save NASA a $2 billion trip back to Earth. Is it worth it to take this $1,000 precaution to potentially save the $2 billion trip back to Earth? I'll leave that up to you to decide. So, 
We took it down from space back in the 90s. Now let's send it back up. Thank you. Thank you, Electric Wave Nation. Our third team is from High Tech High School in San Diego, California. Please welcome Team GSC with their innovation, Gravitational Stimulation Chamber. How is everyone doing today? Are we good? All right. Hi, my name is Alec Mekinlalai. I'm Andrew Oliveira. And I'm Jacob Rosar. And we are Team GSC. Where's the thing? Is this the thing? Okay. So, okay. So on a mission to Mars, it's important that we keep our astronauts healthy. Um, in a journey like this, the astronauts can face certain problems. On Earth, the human body is naturally adapted to Earth's gravity. But while under microgravity, the body does not experience the same constant force. This causes muscle atrophy and loss in bone density. Muscles can lose up to 20% of mass and could even drop at a rate of 5% a week. Bone loss follows a similar trend. Bones deteriorate at a rate of 1% a month. The total loss could reach up to 60% and takes astronauts' bones an estimated two to three years to regain. Our product can help fix this problem. So with the GSC, or Gravitational Simulation Chamber, our product requires a spinning or trombol, or cylinder that is, that will produce a simulated gravity by using centripetal force. So the centripetal force will produce the simulated gravity and what we found is that the trombol will have to spin at an estimated rate of 20 revolutions per minute to produce 1 g of centripetal force that will simulate Earth's gravity. And at 12 revolutions per minute, it will emulate uh, Mars's gravity. This will allow the astronauts to change how fast it spins once they get to Mars and also when they come back. Um, we'll power this by using a multi-speed DC motor and this will also allow the, the astronauts um, to this also allows the astronauts to basically help them uh, get adapted to the different uh, gravity forces. A main part of our product is that with the small diameter that we have, we can fit this entire, this entire uh, trommel inside of the spaceship itself. So this will save uh, resources, uh, expenses, and it also makes it um, much easier to transport. So with any product, there's obviously going to be critiques. Before we came here, we actually were able to talk to Buzz Aldrin, one-on-one -on -one interview, and get a review of our product. So he gave us a few critiques, and this is what he said. The first thing is that he said, sleeping in this simulated gravity environment wouldn't actually help. So what would happen is they would actually need to move, force themselves to exercise in this artificial gravity in order to decrease the bone and muscle loss. He also said that if they were to move their head in this small, compact space with such a high amount of force, it would get them dizzy. So with these critiques, we tried to improve our product. This is what it came up with. So what we have here is we thought, how are they supposed to exercise and move their heads and not feel dizzy? So we decided to come up with some exercises that would get them to get fit without getting dizzy. 
So the type of exercise that we'll be able to do inside the GSC would be leg press, preacher curls, uh, elastic flies, and leg lifts. This can all be done with an elastic band. And so with these exercises, they're all done from a stationary position that doesn't require the head to move, thus making them not dizzy. Now, in order to understand this more, we went deeper into our research. We found out that even though astronauts are exercising at least an average of two hours a day, they still have the same amount of bone loss as people on Earth that are bedridden. So our product, the GSC, should be able to help the astronauts if they sleep under that simulated gravity and they exercise under it. Now, in order for this to work, it's important that we test it. There are two factors that go into this. The first one is the physics. So the biggest thing that's important for our product is that it has to produce centripetal force. Without it, it's worthless. So we could test this by sending it into space, spending millions of dollars, or we could do it on Earth with simple physics. So here we have a graph. On the side, you can see the g-forces. On the bottom, there's time. With this experiment, what we did was on our phones, we downloaded an accelerometer. What that does is it records the amount of force for every time it moves. So as a result, we did this. We got a bucket, put our phone in there, 360 rotation, and every time those lines go up, that shows that the phone is feeling a high amount of force. As the lines go down, that's when the phone is feeling weightless. In relation to the GSC, the astronauts would feel this. Now, the second part is the physiology. Now, in order for it to us to test that, we can't do that unless our product does uh, produce centripetal force. And we actually have a prototype of our product. Once again, we are Team GSC, and thank you. Thank you, Team GSC. Our fourth team is also from High Tech High School in San Diego, California. Please welcome Vert to Spatial Incorporated with their innovation, Nix. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You may remember us from our previous presentation, in which we started with a very bad joke, and we enjoy tradition, so we're going to be doing it again. So here it goes. Uh, so <laughs> NASA can assure you one thing with their space program, that your tax dollars will go further. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was more adult. Anyways, I'm Ben Sennis, as you may remember. I'm Dane Rosen. I'm Peyton Roberts. And I'm Dominic Asmar, and we are Virtus Spatial. And together, we have developed the Nix. So there are many problems to overcome before we can achieve a successful mission to Mars. Out of the supplies needed to set up and establish a colony on Mars, water will be the most essential. Without oxygen, you will die in minutes. Oxygen can be generated from water. Without water, you will die in days. Without food, you will die in weeks. But you need water to grow food. Water is the most essential material in any extraplanetary colonization. The average human drinks 2.2 liters of water a day. So like this? Yes. But for a colony of 100 people, you would have to get 80,000 of those bottles. According to NASA, 
The crew? According to NASA, the crew of the International Space Station requires 10,000 pounds of water per crew member a year. This water is used for drinking, washing, and production of oxygen through electrolysis. So what about recycling the water? Well, through recycling, this requirement can be reduced down to 7,500 pounds of water. That doesn't seem like much of a difference, especially since it costs, or sorry, especially since, especially since it costs NASA $10,000 to send up one pound into orbit. For example, if an astronaut needs 20, 000, 20 pounds of water per day for water, drinking, and oxygen, that's about 2,000 pounds of water for a colony of 100 people. Now, if we times that by 365 days, we get about 700,000 pounds of water per year. That's about $7 billion just for water alone. With this much money and weight being put on water, there needs to be another way to get water to and from Mars. We estimate that the NICS must produce 1,500,000 gallons of water per year to sustain for a colony of 100 people. This water assumes that... This water assumes that water will be recycled as well as on the International Space Station. It also includes a 100% contingency of, it also includes 100% contingency for emergencies. We estimate, there's a lot of guessing about where there might be water on Mars. But there is one place that we know there's water and a lot of it, the North and South Poles of Mars. Now, if only there was some way that we could, we could mine this ice on the poles. This is where the NICS comes in. The NICS strongly represents a modern-day tunnel boring drill with its one diameter uh, uh, measurements. It can produce up to one, over one cubic meter of snow per hour, and the whole front of the drill is covered in hundreds of tungsten carbide drill bits. Uh, and it can run 24 hours a day due to its computer operating systems. To reach this goal, the NICS must mine 115 gallons of water per hour for at least half of the year to sustain for a colony of 100 people. To fulfill this need, <laughs> the NYX only needs to require a modest one cubic meter of ice per hour. That means that every two, approximately two days, one storage container will be filled in which we'll swap it out with one of the remaining nine storage containers. To estimate the power of the NYX needs, we can compare it to a Zamboni, a machine used to resurface ice rinks. A Zamboni uses electric motors for propulsion and to power a large auger to shave ice. Functions similar to what the NYX will do. The Zamboni uses eight horsepower for its hydraulics and a 17 horsepower motor to move. One horsepower is equivalent to 704 to 5 watts, which, we, which means we'll need about 19,000 watts or 19 kilowatts. To be on the safe side, we added a 50% reserve, which rounds to about 30 kilowatts. This is the power we need to be able to provide for the NYX. On Earth, a NASA grade solar panel with approximately a 33% uh, conversion efficiency can produce about 400 watts per square meter. Uh, the NYX will need uh, about 30 kilowatts, and so with half the sun's intensity on Mars, we will need approximately 150 square meters. But we added a 33% reserve to get us to about 200 square meters of solar panels. That will be a 2 by 10 array on the top of each one of our 10 uh, storage containers. To separate the generation of power from its use, the solar panels will charge a bank of batteries that can easily be swapped in and out of the NICS. For comparison, the bank of batteries in a Zamboni has 510 amp hours of energy. Multiplying this number by 12 volts, we get the total watts available. For this Zamboni, it comes to 6,120 watts of energy. This is uh, plenty of energy to run the Zamboni for an hour, uh, an hour or two twice a day. Zambonis have lots of uh, idle time to recharge, so it's kind of pointless to swap in and out batteries. So with the next, we'll need to be able to swap the batteries quickly and efficiently. So, uh, fortunately, this uh, technology exists in the Tesla S sports sedan. Their batteries can hold up to 85 kilowatt uh, watt hours, and we only need about 30 uh, kilowatt hours. So our battery would only weigh about 350 pounds, which is very light and can be swapped out very efficiently. Due to TSA regulations, we weren't allowed to bring the augury component of the NYX. So here's the best visual representation we can provide. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks, Obama.
Thank you, Verda Spatial. Our fifth team is from Delhi Public School in New Delhi, India. Please welcome Albatross with the inno innovation Asteroid Capture System. Namaste, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Abhishek Anand, and this is Shraddha Anand from Delhi Public School, Arkipuram, New Delhi, India. We represent our company, Albatross. Now, Albatross is an amazing bird. It travels huge distances over the oceans with no signs of tiredness, with full perseverance. We as a company and as mankind, too, want to travel huge distances, but not on Earth, in our solar system. The mission to Mars has been humanity's dream ever since Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. But the ultimate dream is not reaching Mars, but colonizing, colonizing Mars, having industries and people there. So what does such a mission require? A rocket, a spaceship, crew, fuel, and resources. Now SpaceX has been conducting its test on the Delta series of rockets, and they are going pretty successful. So I believe that is covered. Uh, lo um, uh, NASA has been, uh, in collaboration with Lockheed Martin, has been creating the Orion spacecraft, which has had positive reviews. And I believe there is no dirt of people who would like to go, go on Mars. With fuel, there is a problem. The, there's a, hu a huge amount of fuel that is required just to cross the gravitational barrier, which increases the payload and makes the mission very expensive and fuel intensive. Now, if you want to colonize Mars, we need to construct a colony there, which requires mineral resources and metals. Now, with a shortage of metals on Earth, this will further intensify the problem. Here is a video representing the same. We don't have audio? Where's the audio? It takes 50 kilos of propellant to deliver just one kilo to Leo. But four more would get you the next 35,000 kilometers. And two more, the last 300 million to Mars to the asteroids, to anywhere in the inner solar system. But those four kilos to Geo each need 50 kilos to get into Leo first. And those two to everywhere else each need four, which each need 50. This exponential nature of the rocket equation has us stuck hugging our planet. So we believe the answer to both these hurdles lies in asteroids. So asteroids will firstly help us save the Earth by, by providing resources. Secondly, it'll make us get closer to, to our dream of colonizing the space. And thirdly, it'll help us deflect potential threats. Now, with respect to the mission to Mars, most of the asteroids in the asteroid bed, which is near Mars, are icy and have water. This water can be hydrolyzed and result in hydrogen. And this hydrogen is one of the most efficient fuels on the planet with a calorific value of 15,000 kilojoule per kg. Also, these asteroids have, are metallic and have platinum, iron, copper, which can be used to construct the settlements on Mars. And thirdly, these can act as, uh, the asteroids can act as a testing ground for our technologies on Mars, because a lot of dust conditions are mimicked on the asteroid. Now, to mine an asteroid, we have to catch it first. But catching an asteroid isn't that easy. An asteroid is not just a piece of rock, but a collection of rocks with a lot of dust. And this dust is harsh and corrosive. And to top it all, the asteroid is spinning and at very high speeds and has high momentum. But not to worry, ladies and gentlemen, Albatross now presents the answer to asteroid capture. The asteroid capture system, or the ACS. Our ACS comprises of a cylindrical flexible bag, which is embedded with rings on its lateral surface area. The bag is attached to thrusters using tethers. Let's go more into more detail. So a bag is made up of a mixture of Nextel and Kevlar because it provides the required me mechanical properties and is also resistant to the space environment. The tethers are made up of the same material and are repeatedly woven to increase the load-bearing capacity in order to cater for the high momentum of the asteroid. Our rings are made up of a carbon composite material and will be actuated using shape memory alloy actuators. Now shape memory alloy actuators reduce the weight of the payload and also 
minimize any chances of damage to the asteroid because the metal is actually programmable. And using a fuzzy logic real-time learning algorithm, we can uh, provide a surface that is responsive to sensors. So how does all of this come together? Once our ACS has provided, uh, has assessed the asteroid after performing the needed flybys, we engulf the asteroid using the thrusters. And then we pass electricity through our rings and the rings contract, the asteroid now behaves as a single unit. We then let the tethers wind along with the rotating asteroid. After enough energy is stored in the tethers in the form of elastic potential energy, we make use of the principle of conservation of energy and despin the asteroid by pulling the tethers in opposite directions. The tethers are then reeled in using winches and the asteroid is attached to the spacecraft. Now the advantages of using our system is that, um, are that not only do we solve the problems of the spin, the agglomeration of fragments and the dust, but we use the energy of the asteroid to despin the asteroid. Mathematical analysis shows that almost all of the parameters are within the control of the customer. Now Ceres is one of the, is the largest asteroid available in the asteroid belt and the, the entire mantle is icy with water. Now, our calculations show that the amount of energy that the hydrogen obtained is in the, power, in the order of 10 is to about 22 kilojoule. This could potentially drive the entire mission to Mars. So based on our uh, extrapolation from the ISS model, the cost for making such a product for a mid-range asteroid will, will be in terms of 4.5 trillion, which is compared to the 20 trillion dollars as calculated by John Lewis, what the asteroids will be potentially worth. Ladies and gentlemen, our asteroid capture system has the potential to advance space exploration like never before. We are here to gain some kind of investment so that we can take our product to the next level and really do make a difference. Asteroids, got a catch in the world? Thank you. Thank you, Albatross. Our sixth team is from High Tech High School in San Diego, California. Please welcome Radiation Defense with their innovation, ARDA. I just want to start this off by saying hi to my mom. Okay. Hi, mom. My mom's back at home watching right now, too. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Alec. And I'm Liam, and we're from sunny San Diego, California. And we're here to make a Mars mission possible and talk a little bit about eye protection. Oh, can we get a next slide? <laughs> oh. Which button? Okay. So, what's the problem? Radiation. Radiation is everywhere. Radiation is on Earth. Radiation is in the galaxy. And when this happens, radiation is coming from supernova. Stars collapsing. Stars, can you guys hear me? Stars collapsing. Stars colliding. And when these stars collapse, helium nuclei spreads. And this is very bad. When uh, the helium nuclei spreads, it uh, rips apart the DNA like that was talked about in the first uh, presentation we had. And uh, this is a bad thing. We don't want our DNA being ripped apart. Uh, we were, gonna, we're here to talk about eye protection, so this is like a, kind of a basic diagram of what we're trying to talk about. Inside you'll see fiber cells, and they're a pretty important uh, part of the eye, and they're surrounded by epithelial cells. 
Now, the epithelial cells kind of act as a stem cell. So when the fiber cells are needed, the epithelial cells turn into them. But in space, the fiber cells and the epithelial cells don't work together. The epithelial cells stop making fiber cells, and the fiber cells become subject to the radiation in space. Statistics have actually shown that 36 out of 39 astronauts came back, from, came back to Earth and got cataracts. So this is very bad. And after five to 10 years, they got this cataracts. And imagine going to Mars, and they get cataracts in Mars, and we'll have blind astronauts, which is very bad. Very bad. Uh, this is our solution. This is Arda. Uh, it's a lead-infused polyethylene. Uh, the polyethylene and the lead combat the helium pretty well. And you see that Arda is a, mat, is a, is a helmet, and we hope that this um, adds to our protection. Here's a look at our first prototype, which is terrible. Because, well, radiation is coming in from every single angle from... It could be hitting your head, it could be hitting the back of your head, it could be hitting your chin. If you just have a pair of glasses, this is going to do nothing for you. So, so that's why we have the, the helmet. Um, if you can see here, you can see the eyes aren't being covered um, with, the, with the helmet. Uh, you can think of the eyes um, kind of as 5% of your head, and the rest of your head is 95%. So we're hoping that the 95% protection is going to be better than zero protection. Um, we really hope that this uh, helps our astronauts not develop cataracts in space, and we think that it's really going to help. And we think it's just such a simple solution to such an unaddressed problem. True. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be white here, but it's, our slogan is ARDA, protection, protection today, prevention, prevention tomorrow. tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, we have one more thing. Uh, we've really had a good time here, and we kind of have a, we just kind of prepared something for you, so we'd like to, we'd like to show it to you. I have a wrap. Thank you. Yes! Can yes. uh, I get a hand clap, please? Are you hands Okay. Yo! Check it out. Hold up. I got out of my phone. Here we go. Okay, this is cool. Astronaut radiation defense armor is good for him and it's good for her. So what? So what? It's lean, mean, a radiation fighting machine just lead infused with what? Fricka fricka polyethylene. That, that had to be definitely one of the more unique presentations or finishes. So thank you, Radiation Defense. That was, that was very impressive. And you only had, what, three days to write the rap? So very good. Um, our 17th team is from Wheeler Center for Advanced Studies in Marietta, Georgia. Please welcome Effervest with their innovation, Effervest Bioreactor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, I need your help with something. Could you please applaud if you think that humans should go to Mars? Awesome. Well, today I'm here to present the innovation that will get us there, the effervesce bioreactor. 
So before we begin, I'd like to introduce our team. Um, we're from the Wheeler Center for Advanced Studies, and that, ha that program has a specific emphasis on STEM education, which has helped us a lot uh, with our scientific excellence as well as our innovation skills. But equally important, we believe, is our team's intellectual diversity. So uh, that said, each of us has focused on a different uh, specific career set within the scientific um, realm. Uh, so going from left to right, Ari Satinoff has focused on chemical engineering as well as inorganic chemistry. Nathaniel Tappan has focused on aerospace engineering and electromechanical engineering. My name is Mihir Belamkanda and I focused on biomedical and uh, micro sociobiology. Uh, so a lot of people have this view of a Mars mission as sort of an abstract scientific venture that doesn't benefit humanity, and this couldn't be farther from the truth. A mission to Mars benefits us all because humanity is at its best when we have a challenge to deal with, and Mars is the next great challenge. Percival Lowell said it best when he said, to the thoughtful observer, there's nothing in the sky so profoundly impressive as the uh, face of the Martian disk. He said that over a century ago, and it still rings true today. So a bit more recently, uh, none other than President John F. Kennedy said that uh, we don't undertake these things because they're easy, but because they're hard. And effervesce uh, certainly had its share of difficulties along the way. So let's begin at the beginning, the first question we asked all those months ago. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle to a Martian colony right now? Our first guess, like many people's, was oxygen. It seems logical, right? Um, we need oxygen to survive, and there isn't any oxygen on Mars. But if you look at the research, it turns out that many Martian colony plans actually involve too much oxygen. This is a, this is a graph from a recent paper out of MIT. Uh, necessary plant growth actually causes oxygen spikes, which can lead to dangers such as explosions, since oxygen is volatile, as well as um, uh, stress on living things from excess oxygen. The real problem that Martian colonies are facing is a severe lack of energy. Energy is really the backbone of any Martian colony. It's used for things as diverse as medical systems, electromagnetic radiation shielding, resource acquisition, and research and scientific capacity. Uh, everything really depends on energy, and effervesce is the key to energy. So in the past, we've had really uh, three options for energy on Mars. Um, wind has been largely ruled out because wind on Mars, while it does exist, is very sporadic and hard to predict. Nuclear energy is very difficult and dangerous to implement even here on Earth, let alone on a Martian colony. And our final option was solar. Solar has been the main option, but it does have four huge flaws. Uh, first of all, solar technology is very bulky. Uh, solar panels right now take up a lot of room on a limited spacecraft, and that's a very fundamental problem. Uh, second of all, solar technology uh, produces electricity, which is very hard to store, since our current battery technology is very inefficient and also takes up a lot of room. Uh, third, solar panels are fragile. As you can see from this image, solar panels are not at all difficult to break, and once they're broken, especially on a planet like Mars, they're very difficult to fix. Uh, fourth and lastly, solar energy is cyclic. So obviously you can't have solar power during the night, which is a problem, but the greater problem, um, I actually think a previous group talked about this, uh, many Martian colonies are being planned to be set up around the Martian poles uh, to take advantage of the liquid water there, but the problem with that is during the pol Martian polar night, solar energy is unavailable for months at a time. Clearly, we need a better solution. That's where effervesce comes in. So during its creation, we focused on two main questions. First of all, how can we make a solution that really stands up to the rigorous and demanding Martian environment? And second of all, how can we make that solution efficient by utilizing as many of the resources that already exist on Mars as possible? Effervesce was our answer to this. So let's go over what it actually is. FFS has three main units. The first unit focuses on producing methane. How this works is biomass is input into the unit. Uh, this biomass is then digested by a clostridia microorganism into hydrogen. Um, then carbon dioxide is input uh, from the Martian atmosphere. And these two gases, carbon dioxide and hydrogen, are metabolized by a second microorganism, a methanogen, into methane. Now, in order to utilize this methane, we're going to need oxygen to burn it. That's where unit two comes in. So unit two can get oxygen from two places. Either it can siphon it off from the excess oxygen we talked about earlier, or for some redundancy and, and safety measures, we can generate oxygen uh, in the unit itself using a technique known as uh, vacuum ultraviolet photoionization. Now that technique is a little bit technical and my time is limited, so I've included a citation to a research paper that explains it very well. Um, 
Okay, so now that we have our methane and our oxygen, we can move on to the third unit. So these two gases can be stored separately from the unit, uh, and they actually have 10 times greater storage potential than our current battery technology, so we've eliminated a lot of the problem. And once we are ready to utilize them, we bring them to unit three, where they are processed uh, by a generator into electricity. Now, all three of these units have counterparts on Earth today that are functional. They're at a very high technology readiness level, but they have not yet been put together into a single unit like FRVS. So the microorganisms of FRVS are really its heart. Uh, we are planning on specifically using uh, four microorganisms. Um, uh, Clostridium bajorinki, Clostridium butricum, Methanobacter gutstrachii, and Methanobacter smithii. So that's a mouthful. What does it actually mean? Uh, these these uh, microorganisms were specifically chosen because they are hardy, adaptable, and well uh, suited for the Martian climate. Uh, we've very rigorously checked to make sure that they can survive within Mars. However, there's no contamination risk since they do require biomass to survive and that biomass is only available within FRVS. Here you can see a view of the entire reactor. It looks large, but we did this just to include detail. FRVS is fully uh, scale scalable. In this view, you can see a wireframe model of the turbine. We've carefully uh, CAD constructed every part of the unit. That's, those are the images you've been looking at so far, and uh, it's ready for implementation. And that's another view of the model. So, uh, in conclusion, commercially we have found no patents that come close to the FRVS design and we're investigating a patent of our own. Our business plan is to partner with an existing company like SpaceX or Google Labs to begin physical construction. FRVS is a unique solution to a complex problem. It solves for many issues with few resources and um, it's really a case study in innovation. This is no pipe dream. Uh, in quite a few ways, we can use it to make our Mars dreams a reality. Thank you. Thank you, FRVS. Our eighth team is from High Tech High School in San Diego, California. Please welcome Thor Incorporated with their innovation, Thorium based nuclear reactor. Hello everyone, I'm Mark Gavitt, and uh, this is my partner, Daniel Mortarport. And we're here to bring power to the power pitches. I, I told him not to say that. Okay. Um, throughout our time here on Earth, there's been countless attempts at finding the most optimal energy source. We've gone and still continue to endure horrendous endeavors throughout this search sending unfortunate workers to the depths of our world in order to mine coal, which is only to be quickly burnt and then left to lay and rot on the surface. We've become reliant upon natural oils, which has in turn left not only our environment in shatters, but hindered relations between countries around the world and with my mom, who is getting sick and tired of me asking for gas money. <laughs> We've seen tremendous upheaval in making sure that we optimize solar, wind, and hydro energy sources, so they're not all that bad. But um, to get back to being pessimistic, to provide a nation, let alone a city, on these sources of energy would require dramatic effort. Um, so nuclear energy. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima. We know the consequences. But all these disasters have 
Well, we know them because they have caused such effects that we've seen a mass public shaming of these sources, and with good reasons. These disasters could have been avoided if we had taken a different path not too long ago. In the 1950s, a proposal was proposed. We could have nearly eliminated the risk of meltdowns, waste, and nuclear weapons. All that was required was that we use thorium as fuel for a nuclear reactor instead of uranium. Thorium is at least three times more common than uranium, and its half-life is only 500 years while compared to 10,000 with uranium. Not to mention that it cannot be used for nihilistic reasons, which brings us to one of the main problems with thorium in the past. As the Cold War was brewing, our government felt that our need for nuclear weapons, which could only be created with the waste of uranium and not thorium, was more important than having a clean, safe, affordable, abundant, and sustainable so source of energy. So the funding was cut. It is estimated that a um, piece of thorium at just the size of a marble could power your entire life. And we have tons of it here on Earth, the Moon, oh, and Mars. Well, Mark, I have some news for you. This is not the energy and environment category. We are presenting the giant leap to Mars challenge. I mean, like, we can change it, right? Well, Do you have a better idea? Yeah, how about solar? Nah, wait, no. Solar's bad because there's even less sun on Mars. The constant dust storms will cover up the panels and tamper with them. Have you got anything else? Hydro's pretty cool, but hydro's impossible on Mars because there's no large bodies of water. Any water we're going to find, we're going to keep to ourselves. Well, then you must have another alternative. Mars has wind, but the low density makes the wind have little to no force. Well, what about nuclear? It's about time. I have just the right kind of reactor in mind. Click it. This is our pebble bed thorium nuclear reactor. It's not pretty. The most unique part about the pebble bed is that it's meltdown proof. It has what's been called an inherent safety system. Click. Unlike other reactors, which can be mostly be classified as deterministic, such as one in Fukushima, whose safety relied upon several generators that, yes, had high probabilities of being able to start up and replace each other if needed had a tsunami come and knock them all out. Our system is inherent because unlike uranium, thorium is not fizzle, basically meaning that when left on its own, thorium will not start generating heat. Instead, to start the reaction, a neutron must be added, meaning that to end the cycle, all that needs to be done would be to take away the source of neutrons. Also, I should mention that uranium-235, which, which is what most reactors use, is almost as rare as platinum. The coolant in our reactor is helium, we use it because it has a low heat capacity. It carries the heat generated by the thorium graphite pebbles and flows through the reactor until it gets to the water. It then boils the water and steam goes up the reactor and spins the turbine. When it evaporates, it falls back down and the cycle repeats itself again. The helium flows through the cylinder and goes back to the thorium graphite pebbles. It is truly a one-of-a-kind reactor, and we hope to be, have it used in the power of the colonies on Mars. Buzz Aldrin once said, when we set out to land on the surface of Mars, I think we should as a nation, as a world, commit ourselves to supporting a growing settlement and colonization there. Daniel and I both truly believe that upon this colonization, we must show that we have learned from our mistakes here on Earth and choose to use only the safest and most sustainable energy source known. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thor. Our final giant leap to Mars team is from Liberty High School in Virginia. Please welcome Merritt with their innovation, Interstellar Hazard Reduction. Hi, I'm Hannah Steele. And I'm Yuri Schneider. And we are the Interstellar Hazard Reduction Team, presenting our system merit. Space debris and asteroids pose a major threat to any craft leaving the surface of the Earth. 
Objects in space travel at approximately eight kilometers per second. Thus, if one of these objects were to impact the craft, it would not only cripple the craft, but it would also kill the entire crew. While there are existing systems to track asteroids and there are current maps of the space debris field surrounding the Earth, these systems have several flaws. These systems, including the Department of Defense's satellite catalog and legend, have a limited range of about 50,000 kilometers, and the maps of space debris can be, can be affected when rogue debris comes into perspective. Asteroid trackers can also only track objects larger than the size of a softball. These systems can also fail at times. For example, in 2013, a bus-sized meteor crashed into Russia while passing through the atmosphere going unnoticed by any sensors. This meteor left extensive damage. Space travel has always been dangerous, but for the last 30 years, we've had the luxury of sending just crafts into deep space without human life being in the equation. If we wish to explore our solar system, we need to send humans out into the space. And the best way we can ensure their safety is by using a detection and deflection system. The detection aspect of our product, known as MERIT, employs advanced infrared technology that can detect objects within a range of 50,000 kilometers, and it has a low power drain. MERIT utilizes an infrared sensor, which six of which will be placed on the actual craft, that will send out infrared pulses in 20-minute intervals, giving the craft approximately 20 minutes to make evasive maneuvers. This system works similarly to radar in that it sends out an infrared pulse which, when striking an object, will bounce off of said object and return to the craft where simple calculations will be made to determine the location of this threat. Now in the unlikely scenario that a threat cannot be evaded, a railgun has been implemented as Merit's deflection system. The railgun will utilize two copper rails which will be approximately 4.5 meters in length and fire a 3.2 kilogram iron projectile at anything deemed a threat. Now, we have a, the maximum threat we can fire at would be about 60 centimeters in diameter. Although the railgun takes up a lot of power, if we implement a super capacitor on the actual craft, we can provide the adequate power to make this a very feasible uh, endeavor. The fact that the entire merit system mounts to the actual craft makes it unique all on its own, considering most, most current programs are actually just on Earth. The U.S. Navy also is starting to test out railguns on their destroyers, which means that if we were to simply take those railguns and downscale them, we can implement them on the actual craft. And also the one benefit of using a railgun is it is completely reusable, so it's very convenient for NASA. Merit, especially its infrared technology, has many applications. One of these applications is manned spaceflight. Merit could be used exactly as designed in missions both inside low Earth orbit and into deep space, such as on a mission to Mars. Merit's infrared technology could be utilized on satellites to help create a more accurate map of the debris field surrounding our Earth. Merit's infrared technology could also be used on a mission into deep space, such as Voyager 2. This, this technology could help create accurate maps of these unexplored locations. Merit's full system could be implemented on the International Space Station to help create a debris protection program for this value, valuable international asset. The top priority is the safety of the crew and the craft itself. After doing some tests to prove that these are actually feasible, feasible plans, we also know that this project would cost between 50 and 100 million dollars. But in comparison, the moon program cost about 2.3 billion dollars. So this is feasible for protecting our astronauts. Merit will allow safe travel into deep space with our detection and deflection system. A system like MERIT is very necessary to ensure a safe mission to Mars. In, in, while celebrating Apollo 13's anniversary celebration this month, we should remember a main message that this mission gave to us. Failure is not an option. Without MERIT, failure could be a possibility in long-term space exploration. Thank you.